It means a lot to all of us. And today is my mother-in-law's birthday, like anniversary. So, and it happened when Swamiji was here. He was sleeping here and we got the news from India. And she passed away. So what, what more can we ask for each time when he's here? It's to the ancestors. Because of them, we are all blessed. And whatever we are, it's all because of the rishis and the parents and the ancestors and because of all your blessings, because he's everywhere, right? So thank you so much for coming. And uh, happy Mother's Day. I wanted to say a few. Somebody sent me a birding and I like it this morning. I remember my mother's prayers. And they have always followed me. They have clinged to me in all my life. So I really hmm. thank, thank, thank you. And thank you, Swamiji, for coming. There is no words, no words. People go, you know, old times. Everybody used to go to jungles and forests to look for the rishis for the teaching. And, you know, yesterday we had a retreat. And I can't even say, it's beyond words to say, that we are so, so blessed that we have here traditional teaching, which is the real, real teaching which is not available. I really tell you, I'm not saying because I just want to say it. I just mean it. So that's why there's only few people like who can really see that, have that vision. And we are so, so blessed. Life is going too short. So please, please, whatever is left, let's make our priority. Because we want to have this life the last one. Why to go through all this affliction, pain? Life is pain. That's the reality of life. Hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm not giving speech here. I'm just expressing my thoughts. Thank you. <laughs> Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvina Vaghita Mastuma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 I've been asked to talk about freedom in relationship. Freedom in relationship. It will followed by the questions from you. <coughs> relationship is something very natural to human beings. Because human being is a social being and therefore we are constantly related. From the time that we wake up in the morning till the time that we go to sleep, we are related to somebody or something. <clears throat> Our primary relationship are with human beings, sometimes animals like pets like trees in our garden and with everybody else in the world. Yesterday somebody said, how about Trump? We have, we have a relationship with him, him also, with everybody we have a relationship. And to have a relationship is a privilege. The human being has enjoyed the privilege of having a relationship. It can be between spouses, between parents and children, between siblings, between friends, with colleagues, 
with my superiors, my subordinates, even with my servant, my master, my pet, shopkeeper, with everybody we have a relationship. And each of these relationships can be a source of joy and also a source of sorrow. Most of our joy comes from our relationships and most of our sorrow also comes from relationships. <coughs> Therefore, it is important to understand the dynamics of relationships. If we are talking about freedom in relationship, that means there can be bondage also. If you understand what bondage is in a relationship, then we will be able to understand what freedom is. When in relating to somebody, I feel hurt, I feel guilty, the relationship creates sorrow and unhappiness in me, then we say that it is a bondage in the relationship. On the other hand, relating to somebody makes me happy, I recall freedom in the relationship. Because freedom and happiness always go together. Sorrow and bondage always go together. There is a famous statement in Manusmuti which says, Sarvam Paravasham Dukkham. Where Paravasada is there, dependence is there, helplessness is there, that itself is Dukkham, that itself is sorrow. Sarvam Atmasham Sukham. Atavasada, where there is independence or freedom, then there is Sukham. So the relationship can become a source of happiness when there is freedom. The same can become the source of unhappiness when there is bondage. Therefore, relationships are, relationships are very important to us. Same time, the freedom in relationship also is very important. Why are relationships important to us? Because most of our happiness comes from relationships. It is said that about 80% of our happiness comes from relationships. At the same token, 80% of unhappiness also would come from relationships. Thus, if we can manage a relationship properly, in an intelligent way, in a mature way, then we can make a relationship a source of happiness. On the other hand, if we do not manage it in a mature way, it is quite possible that it can create all the unhappiness for us also. They were important to understand what is freedom in relationship. One thing that the relationship does is whenever I am related to somebody, there arises in me always an expectation. More often than not, our relationships are characterized by expectation. What is the expectation? What do we expect? this person to do for me. We are generally in lookout for our own self-interest. And therefore, a relationship also is utilized as an opportunity to serve self-interest. 
When would my interest be served? When you conduct yourself in a manner which is acceptable to me. When you conduct yourself in a manner which pleases me. And therefore, basically, I want you to please me. My basic love is for myself. Not only myself, but a pleased self. I love not just myself, but I love the happy self. I love the pleased self. And that is the only pursuit in our life. All that we want in our life, through many desires and through many demands that we make on life, all we are seeking is one simple thing, and that is to be happy. And when can I be happy? When I am happy with myself. So when I am related to you, I often have a tendency to utilize you so that I can become happy with myself. That's all I'm seeking. And there were unknowingly we utilize every occasion, every relationship as a means of deriving self-satisfaction. And I can have self-satisfaction only when you satisfy me, only when you please me. When can you please me? When you do what pleases me and refrain from doing what displeases me. Unfortunately, everything does not please me. There are certain things that please me, there are others that do not please me. If everything please me, then there will be no condition at all. In which case, I don't have to use any particular person or situation for being happy, because everything pleases me, but it doesn't. Unfortunately, certain people, certain situations, certain events, certain things please me. And other people, other situations, other events displease me. I should not even just certain people please me. But those people, only when they conduct themselves in a certain way, then they please me. If they conduct themselves in a different way, they displease me. Meaning that a person can be a source of my happiness and the same person can also be a source of my unhappiness, depending upon what that person does or does not do. If that person conducts himself or herself in a manner that pleases me, I'm happy. If they conduct themselves in a manner that displeases me, I'm unhappy. Therefore, your conducting yourself in a certain manner becomes very important to me because that is what creates a pleased self. That is what is means of my happiness. Then if you conduct yourself in a different way, then I am not pleased, I can even be displeased. Thus, at all the times, in every relationship, there is on my part an expectation from you as to how you should conduct yourself, how you should look, how you should talk, how you should walk, and whatever. 
there's always an expectation, sometimes expressed overtly and very often not expressed overtly, but it is covertly there within my mind. Because, unfortunately, I'm not able to make myself happy. Since I cannot make myself happy, therefore, I need you to make me happy. And only when you satisfy that condition which pleases me, then alone you can make me happy, therefore, it becomes necessary that you should satisfy those conditions which make me happy. Now this is the source of happiness as well as source of unhappiness. It's very often that my expectations are not satisfied. Meaning that people fail to satisfy my expectations or people do not bother to satisfy my expectations or people deliberately do not satisfy my expectations. Depends on our relationships. But whenever expectations are there, there is always a possibility that those expectations may not be satisfied and there were always a possibility that I would be disappointed. And what happens is that when you do not satisfy my expectation, I put up an equation there that you rejected my expectation. I interpret that as a rejection of me, you follow? What you did not do is you did not satisfy my expectation, did not conduct yourself in a manner that would satisfy my expectation, that's okay. If it stops there, there's no problem. Whenever I gets connected, you know, capital I, that is when happiness or unhappiness is there. If I simply say that you did not satisfy my expectation, that would be the end of it. You rejected my expectation, okay. But what do I say? You rejected me. I connect myself with my expectation or desires or demands. And when my demand or expectation is not satisfied, it rejected. I interpret that as my rejection, rejection of me. Is a rejection causes hurt in me? Hurt causes pain in me. So that is why the expectations are essentially the greatest source of our unhappiness in life. And unfortunately, those expectations always surface in my mind. They are stored within my mind, but they surface whenever I relate to somebody. It surfaces. What the expectation is will depend upon many things. Upon our history, upon the chemistry and stuff like that. But almost invariably, there is always an expectation in relationship. Right now I am talking to you, I am relating to you. In my mind, a hidden agenda is always there. I may not express it. I may, I may be clever enough that you don't even ever suspect it. But it is quite possible that in my mind, there are expectations from you. Sometimes you find, you know, that people who give you talks or lectures, sometimes they get excited or they get angry also. If your cell phone rings, a person gets up and does something, if you don't pay attention to what I'm t when I'm talking, sometimes people come late, you know, these are the things that really make people upset. When I get upset, that means that there was an expectation. Sometimes we don't even know what expectations we are entertaining. 
But when we get disappointed or upset, then we know that some expectation was there. We always want to control others. We feel secure and, and, and empowered when we can control others. I can control you all, so that you conduct yourself as I want you to. There are certain rules, the ladies on one side and gentlemen on the other side. In this kind of lectures, ladies should only wear clothes certain kind in a certain way, you know, and not another way. Sometimes that you should have a tilak on your forehead and you know, depends on what background I'm coming from, you follow? <coughs> I'm coming from orthodox background, then there may be different kind of expectations. If I'm not coming from orthodox background, it may not matter to me who is wearing what clothes and who is sitting where, etc. But depending upon me, my need, my emotional need, you follow? That you do something in a certain way is really my emotional need because then alone I feel comfortable with myself. Otherwise I feel rejected, insulted. I feel that you don't care for me. Because I asked you to wear a sari, you did not. I want you to put on dog, you did not. I want you to sit down, you know, with folded, you don't. It's up to me to interpret and conclude whether I'm accepted by you or rejected by you, approved by you or disapproved by you. Nothing to do with you, it's all to do with me because it is my need to be accepted, it is my need to be approved. And I seem to use every opportunity to eke out or seek approval, accept it, you know, acceptance. Because I can be happy with myself only when I'm accepted. I cannot be happy with myself when I'm rejected. I can be happy with myself when I'm approved. I cannot be happy when I'm not approved. So when I cook, then I, even though I may not express, there is always an expectation that food was very good, very delicious. When I talk like this, I have an expectation within me. Then later people saw me very good talk. <laughs> Suppose you don't say that, I may not, you know, within my mind I feel disappointed. <laughs> Just because I do not think that my talk is good. Only when you say that it was good, then alone I feel that it was good, you see? We don't think very highly of ourselves. We don't have much esteem about ourselves. The low self-esteem, looking down upon ourselves. A part of my mind, as we say yesterday, is always critical about me. I am my greatest enemy in that sense. I create most unhappiness for me by criticizing me, not accepting me, rejecting me. So I often disapprove of myself because I expect myself to be such and such and when I find that I am not there, I disapprove of myself. I always expect that I should be right, I should be perfect, I should be this. And then when I find it is not, I become dissatisfied with myself. So self-dissatisfaction is always an undercurrent running in my mind. That's what makes me unhappy, makes me sad. And if that self-dissatisfaction undercurrent keeps on building up, it makes me depressed. Meaning that the cause of all unhappiness, sorrow, sadness is within me. And what is that? Self-non-acceptance. Self-rejection. Sometimes self-condemnation. And the world obliges me also. The world also obliges me. This man, well, this couple just recently got married. 
And this man wants to please his wife, so she gives a list of go to the vegetable market and then buy these vegetables, this, this, and he brings them with all enthusiasm. Poor fellow doesn't know how, what a banjal is and what banana or how to pick, choose, he doesn't know that. So he goes to a shop which is most expensive and asks him to you know, give me this, this, this and whatever. He comes home and his wife, this kind of eggplant, what is, what is this? This is all, you know, this is old. This is stale. What is Oh, you don't know how to buy okra. You know, this is a way to do that. These are all ripe. That fellow becomes so nervous. You know, he is under your control the whole life, I tell you. you know. This is the way. You do this two, three times and then you create such a complex in that person. So like that, if you have been treated like this as we were growing up, so many complexes have really been created in ourselves and therefore we don't think we are good enough. But even when I scored 85 percent marks and I brought to my father with all pride, 85, your cousin got 90 percent. Oh, you got 90 percent, why not 95? Well, never, you could never satisfy them. Regardless of what you did, there never was a word of appreciation. Sometimes, that may be unfortunate, but sometimes this happens to us. Or there are always some people in our life who are like that. There may be an uncle, a maternal uncle, a paternal uncle, somebody or some neighbor, whose business only is to pull you down. They compare you with their son, with their this, see look at my son, is like, and you are this, you know. So, meaning that we have gone through so many variety of experiences where we have not been held in high esteem. And particularly by people who are important to us. As the Swami used to say, everybody has a significant view in their life whose opinion or acceptance is very important to us. Maybe my father, maybe my father, maybe my mother, maybe my elder brother, maybe my uncle, maybe my teacher. But, you know, so everybody has significant few in their life whose acceptance or approval is very important because only when they accept me, when they approve me, then I feel that I'm acceptable, I'm approvable. If they do not do that, then I entertain a conclusion in my mind that I am not approvable. So then I come relate to you and now I expect you to do that. I expect the world to keep approving because I don't approve of myself. I am critical of myself. That's the reason why I am very sensitive to criticism. If you criticize, then I don't because I am already critical of myself. And then further, you criticize me, that makes it worse, very bad. So our ability to swallow, accept that criticism has become so little that everything can upset me. And it may be our prarabdha, that we may be stuck with somebody who is very critical, who is very judgmental, who is this, that, what not. That's prarabdha. But we cannot control the one with whom we are related. All we can do is to bring about some changes within ourselves. By which we can create every we can make every relationship. If not a source of joy, at least not a source of unhappiness. I give examples of our Pativrata. You know this, this is an expression in India called Pativrata, Stri. A woman who is Pativrata, for whom the husband is God. And she is totally devoted to her. We hear the stories like Sita, you know, has become the ideal in India and that impossible ideals, but that's kind of ideals are presented to us. 
is all right for Sita because Rama is Rama and so it's quite possible that he may be devoted. But can you imagine Mandodari with Ravana? Can you imagine that? So Mandodari also is counted as a Pativrata Stri, understand? There's another fellow whose name was Vali. You know Vali? His name, his wife was Tara. She's also counted as a Pativrata Stri. Tara, Mando, Dari, Sita. So first is Tara, even before Sita. Second is Mando, Dari. I cannot imagine how these women must have so de- dedicated themselves to this man. Everybody knows Ravana. Vali you may not be very familiar with, but Ravana everybody knows. So what would it have taken for Mandodari to be totally devoted to him? And a wife plays all sorts of roles, you know. She is a brother, she is a friend also, and teacher also, and this also, and that also. So <coughs> Mandodari was everything to him. We, we don't recommend that you become Mandodari or anything, but what I am saying is, it is possible, that's all I am saying. It is possible that someone can relate to even Ravana also in a manner that pleases Ravana and that Ravana is pleased with her. Now that looks like an impossible task, but I am saying possibility. Our Swami used to say, you can love anybody. You can even love a retarded child. That's it. There's a tall order by that, love anybody, the tall order. But apparently we have a potential of being able to love anybody. That potential we have. And the extent to which we can evolve that potential. To that extent, we are evolved people, spiritually evolved people. To that extent, we are happy people. The only way to become happy in life is to evolve. Because nothing can make me happy. I alone is the one who can make me happy. I alone is the one who can make me unhappy. An unevolved I is the source of all unhappiness. Unevolved I Immature I is a source of unhappiness. An evolved I, a mature I, is the source of happiness. Should we become very clear that nobody other than me has the capacity to make me happy or unhappy unless I empower them. Today, because of my immaturity, I empower others to make me unhappy. We need not. So more we grow in our own maturity, more empowered we become, more free we become, more independent we become, and more Insulated we become from the effects of the world outside of ourselves. <clears throat> By insulated I don't mean insensitive. By insulated I mean that we become greater than what the situation is. In that sense, we grow out of this. We grow bigger than that. Swami used to say, the only way to become, become free from pain is to grow bigger than pain, he used to say. So a relationship can become an excellent opportunity to grow. Grow in our maturity, in our purity, in our goodness. Thus a relationship can become an occasion or a means of our self-growth. 
that would be freedom in relationship. When the relationship enables me to become better than what I was, A relationship gives us an opportunity to grow. What is growth? Become better than what we were. What is meant by better? Better means become kinder, more accommodative, more forgiving, more charitable, more compassionate than what we were. Because that is the agenda of the human being really. The purpose of our birth, if the purpose is to become happy, the only way we can become happy is by bringing to manifestation the inherent goodness that is there within ourselves. Because inherently each one of us is a kind, good, loving, beautiful person. Doesn't matter what the shape, shape of the body is and the face is and this, doesn't matter. The heart is inherently a kind, beautiful, loving entity. And so the agenda with which we have come to this embodiment is to, in, to evoke or to invoke that potential bring the manifestation, the inherent beauty that is within ourselves. The relationship becomes an excellent opportunity to bring out that beauty from within myself. That will be freedom in relationship. What beauty? I'll be required constantly to display my kindness and compassion and forgiveness in every relationship. Because there are going to be a number of things other person with whom I related. Always, everybody is imperfect. Everybody is a combination of virtue and vice. So, the person with whom I am related is bound to have things in him or her which are not acceptable to me, which I do not approve of, which I do not like. There are things that I like, there are things that I know are very, see. So what a beautiful, you know, flowers. But then with rose there are always thorns, you know, in this rose. So there are a part that I like, beautiful, but then also thorns come. But then we have discovered a method of how to deal with this so that we are not uh, pinched by the thorn and we can enjoy the roses. And similarly in everybody, there is a rose, the fragrant, tender, beautiful, and there are thorns also. And so, how do we deal with that? By recognizing that rose is the true nature of the person and thorns are not the true nature. The love and kindness is the essential nature of the person. But unfortunately we also find in people anger, greed, self-centeredness. All these also we find. So, remind ourselves that they are not the inherent nature of the person, they are incidental and not inherent. We should know the difference between inherent and incidental. 
A piece of sandalwood is a good example for that. Where sandalwood is inherently fragrant in nature. But it can happen that the sandalwood, if left in water for a few days, its outer surface gets rotted and it starts stinking. So here you have a stinking piece of sandalwood. But the sting is only superficial. And therefore, if you rub that sandalwood with stone, that superficial sting will be removed and the inherent fragrance will become manifest. So we also have fragrance as well as the sting within ourselves. And our agenda is to remove that sting so that the inherent fragrance becomes manifest. That's called maturity, that is called the growth. But then other person also has the same inherent sweetness of fragrance and in that also whatever sting that we find is only incidental. As best as we can, not give importance to that. As best as we can, give importance to the inherent goodness. But Swami, I never find this person, you know, always, I never find that person, you know, kind or good. But every person is kind now and then. Even a big terrorist or a criminal also is kind now and then. When his own little child comes or grandchild comes before him. Even if that does not invoke kindness, at least when he is doing something and he ha- suppose he crushes his own finger, then at least his pain and kindness comes out. What he's saying is that it's always there. He's buried underneath. And so what comes out is only a stink and we think that that's the nature of this person. That's not the nature. So we keep this in mind that whoever it is that we are related to is inherently a good, kind person, but it's quite possible that because of the wrong contact, because of the wrong upbringing, because of wrong orientation, whatever, prarabdha, that all these negative qualities also are there. So Devi Sampad is also there, Asuri Sampad also is there. The divine tendencies are also there, the demoniac tendencies are also there. They are in others and they are in ourselves also. And therefore, as best as possible, we try to relate to a divine being that is in there. And when we find from them this anger and jealousy and insensitivity and impatience and intolerance all manifesting, a two-step response. Do not respond right away to the intolerance or anger or insensitivity. Take a step back and remind the self that this is only incidental, this is only superficial. In spite of this superficial stink, inherently there is a fragrance in that. Then what? Then what do I do? Or what do I try to do? Is to relate the fragrant being rather than to the stinking being. How? By forgiving the person. You see, a person is never angry by volition. Meaning that a person cannot be deliberately angry. In the olden days, the Swami would always invite the audience. Come on, get angry. I invite you to get angry. I said, get angry, you're smiling at me, get angry. I mean, you can perhaps make facial expressions of an angry person, but you cannot get angry. You cannot get cruel. You cannot deliberately become angry, you cannot deliberately become cruel, you cannot deliberately become insensitive or intolerant. These things happen to people, meaning that these demoniac tendencies 
they they grab him, grab this person and dominate that person. At that time, the person is helpless. Although an angry or dominating person appears to be a strong person, and the, the world would think that that sign of strong strength, all of that is sign of weakness. Anger is a sign of weakness. Dominance is a sign of weakness. All of this is helplessness. Person helplessly angry, helplessly intolerant, helplessly bad. If that person had his or her own choice, then that person would choose to be a kind person. Nobody chooses to be an angry person, understand? Given a choice to a person, how would you like to see yourself? An angry person or a kind person? Everyone would like to see themselves a kind person. Is it not so? Meaning nobody is bad by choice. If given the choice, they would prefer always to be good people. Because that is inherent nature. And that's when we feel comfortable. That's with ourselves. Then when we are happy with ourselves. I'm not happy with myself when I'm angry. Or when I'm cruel. When I'm insensitive. That's when I'm helpless. Always regret later on. Why did I do this? Why did I say that? So knowing this, if you step back and not respond to the anger of that person or intolerance of that person or the inhuman aspect of that person, reminding ourselves that this is not the person's true nature, this is only helpless the person is like that. Then, as best as possible, I should respond to the good person in that way. Not responding to the behavior, but responding to the person behind the behavior. The behavior may be cruel. Person behind the behavior is necessarily a kind person. not easy. Because when somebody gets angry at us, first is we get angry. When somebody hurts us, then first immediate response is to retaliate. If you tell me one thing, my usual response is to tell you two things and then to teach you a lesson. So that's our usual response. That's called a one-step response. It's called a impulsive response. Because we also become helpless. So when we respond in that manner, that shows our helplessness also. Two helpless fellows responding to each other, that makes a miserable thing. If one of them becomes not helpless, one of them takes situation in the, char in, in the charge of the situation. And I determine within myself that I'm not going to submit myself to these tendencies. Even though that person's behavior invokes those tendencies in me, Swami, but they keep on pushing my buttons. They keep on telling me going on and on until I become angry. The person doesn't, you know, that's what people do. If you don't become angry, then they will a little more. If you don't become angry, a little more, ultimately they make you angry. What should I do, Swami? But the thing is, that as best as possible, we try not to be controlled, not to submit to that demonic part in ourselves and try to bring out the divine part in ourselves. That's what Mandodari must have done, I guess, you know. How else is that this fellow is the king of de demons, you know? Isn't it? Ravana? I don't know if you have any psychological analysis of Mandodari or what, you know, how their life was, etc. I just, I'm just imagining. It's a tall order. And I, the psychologist may not even, modern world may not even approve of what I'm telling you. They will not approve of keeping your feelings within yourself. They say you're angry, then you just express it. 
two mad people expressing in each other, what do you expect to happen there? Nothing but fire. So somebody has to be sane. And it's our own decision to be sane and not mad. If other person is mad, it is my sankalpa, my decision or conviction to be a sane person as best as I can. We won't be. We will also get excited, we will also respond. But later on, we can learn from this situation. What happened to me and what can I do next time if this happens? Because this is a recurring thing. Particularly with spouses, you are stuck with each other. This is a recurring stuff. So it's not going to stop at just one, one episode. So I learned from that episode. And then I asked myself, where did I go wrong? Oh, I submitted myself to this impulse. What should I do next time? You visualize that person behaving in a certain manner and visualize yourself in a cool manner. That's called rehearsing. That also may not work. When the real time comes, the rehearsal goes away. But again, rehearsal is called abhyasa, you know, the count there, vairagyana, so this morning we heard this sutra. Abhyasa, you know, the count there. Oh Lord, Arjuna asked Lord Krishna, how do I control my mind? Because the impulses control my mind. Lord Krishna says, Abhyasa in the Kamantya, Vairagya Chakrakshade. Abhyasa and Vairagya. What is Abhyasa? Repeatedly practicing a given thing. What is Vairagya? A determination that I do not want to submit myself to these negativities. That I have value for being a positive, good person. So, if I may, again, if I submit myself to the anger, I remind my mind, look mine. Next time, remain a kind person, forgive, large-hearted. Again and again and again and again. It works. You know, because whatever mind is right now is a result of what it has done repeatedly. So we are what we are on account of doing things that we did repeatedly. Abhyasa. So there is always a possible to reverse the whole process. It was on account of unintelligence, immaturity, not knowing how to behave, we have become like this. So now with viveka, with discrimination, with understanding, with maturity, we can reverse that process. We can. It's a matter of conviction. Lord Krishna says, Apiche sudurachara bhajate ma mananyaha sanguriyo samantavya samyak vivasito hisa. Here, Juna, if there is the greatest durachari, greatest sinner, what you may call a terrorist or whatever, your greatest sinner, who has committed all kinds of sin, even if that person also, in his mind, suppose this kind of a conviction arises, I want to be a good person, this is a wrong thing to do. What I am doing is not right, then I am damaging myself. It may look like a, a criminal person is hurting others, but in that process is hurting himself also. That by submitting myself to these negative terms, I am constantly hurting myself. Every time heart attack comes, it leaves some kind of a scar in the heart. Every time an injury happens, some scar is left. Every time you jump on your vehicle, in your spinal cord, some little trauma is there. It may not be noticeable. But every time a shock is there, it leaves a trauma, isn't it? We only know at the age of 45, 50, when the traumas are built up, 
then all of a sudden there's a catch in my back and I can't sit, I can't. It's not that catch happened right away. It's a buildup of those, all those years of trauma. So similarly, every time I get angry, every time we submit ourselves to this tendency, the trauma is left. With the tendency that that will repeat itself, because more it builds up, more vasana, more the habit builds up, more it will again dominate, but more again it will happen. So we have to create a new habit. Anger may become a habit. I must create a new habit of forgiveness, of accommodation, of compassion for a person who is suffering. He is not an angry person. He is a person who is suffering, helpless person, in pain, and doesn't know how to deal with this pain. And therefore it comes out as anger. He deserves my, he or she deserves my sympathy rather than my anger. We will still get angry. But this is how we deliberate. Two-step response. A deliberate response and not an impulsive response. So this is, this conviction should arise in me. That I should always be a deliberate person and not an impulsive person. Only when you deliberate, then our learning comes to help us. When we are impulsive, all learning doesn't come to help us. <laughs>